Well, good morning, Calvary. Hey, glad you're here today. Grab your Bibles with me, if you would, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 is where we will be today. And, uh, and so welcome to those of you that are joining us online or by way of television or the podcast. So glad that you're here today. Welcome also to those of you in Auditorium 2. Thanks for, for being here today. Hey, while you're turning to Matthew chapter 8, let, let me walk through um, I think, as, as many of you know, uh, we have some major things that are going to show up on the ballot when we vote in November. We talked about this a little bit a couple of months ago, and I, I read a quote from theologian Wayne Grudem that has been really helpful for me. He says, I believe that every Christian citizen who lives in a democracy has at the very least a minimal obligation to be well-informed and to vote for candidates and policies that are most consistent with biblical principles. The opportunity to help select the kind of government we will have is a stewardship that God entrusts to citizens in a democracy, a stewardship that we should not neglect or fail to appreciate. That at least means that Christians are responsible to learn enough about the important issues to be able to vote intelligently. And I think that's really an important thing for us to consider. We are privileged to live in a democracy that's a we the people nation, isn't it true? And so we have a, a privilege, not just as good citizens and stewards from a biblical sense, but also from a, a, a democ- democratic sense, to vote and to vote our values. So there's two initiatives that are kind of important for us to bring to attention that are going to show up on this ballot. I just want to talk about one of them today, and it's what's referred to as issue one. As we shared a couple of months ago, there's a proposed amendment, issue one, to the state constitution. Now, that's really important to understand because if, it, if this passes, then it supersedes any other laws that Ohio has once it goes in the Constitution that will legalize abortion up until birth. Just the fact that this amendment to the Constitution legalizes abortion is concern enough. It is against God's word and the teachings of Scripture. On top of that, this is really questionable legislation because it erases the basic rights of parents. The amendment's language clearly forbids any law that directly or indirectly would burden or interfere with any reproductive decisions. If this amendment were to pass, we as Ohio would have one of the most radical legislations of this kind in the whole country. There are specific legal terms there which have been interpreted by courts across the nation to strike down parental notification and consent laws. It would jeopardize basic health and safety protections for patients when it comes to abortions. The proposed amendment will allow minors to obtain abortions, allow minors to obtain even gender reassignment procedures, all without parental notification or consent. It would allow for painful late-term abortions even after 15 weeks and right up until the moment of birth. And over the last few months, we've, we've looked at and talked about different uh, teachings from Scripture, words from Jesus. And there, there was one point where we talked about the fact that at times in our culture, sin will be called good and truth will be called bad. God has created every life beginning in the womb. He has made us male and female. He assigned our gender. God has instituted the role of the family so that the parent is the one who operates in a position of leadership and even authority over their children. This proposed amendment is destructive to families. It is unbiblical. We as believers should be aware and prayerful. We should be prepared to vote our values and to vote no on issue one. For some of you, I know that this might not be the, the most important issue. And for some of you, you're, you're even saying, I, I came to church not to be political. I don't wanna be political in church. And can I tell you, this pastor does not want to either. But there's a difference when those things that are political cross over into the lines of the things that are biblical. And when there are biblical things that we need to consider as values from God's word, it's important for us as God's people to respond. Would you agree? So if, if you ask, hey, what's next? I'll, I'll give you the same three things that we talked about um, a couple of months ago. And, and hopefully it's, it's a little cheesy, but I hope it's memorable. I want you to be a VIP. The letter V is to vote. Would you, would you make a decision now that you will be active and you will vote in this election, that you'll vote 
your values. You have an opportunity to vote early if you want to. I believe uh, it's Wednesday, October 11th. I believe is when early voting begins before the, uh, the, the actual election in November. But make a commitment to vote. The letter I is to inform. And I would encourage you, inform yourself in this. There are a lot of good resources that you can use that letter I for inform. Um, let me give you just a couple. One is the Center for Christian Virtue. The Center for Christian Virtue, which you can search for online, has just lots of great resources that you can go to. Another one that we haven't mentioned before is called seethelanguage.com. If you go to a website called seethelanguage.com, have any of you ever voted for something and you didn't read all of the legislation in advance? Anybody? <laughs> okay, if you're not raising your hand, you, we're going to talk about lying next week, right? And so, <laughs> like, we don't, we just, we're not, I'll just vote. Seethelanguage.com shows you the actual language of this amendment and gives some explanation to help understand, especially parents, why this is such a strategic moment for us to respond. So inform yourself, inform other people, and hey, I get it. Some of you might not agree. And that's why I think it's really important that we do all these things, that we vote, that we inform ourselves and learn these things, and ultimately that we pray, that letter P in VIP, is that we pray for God's wisdom in how to vote. We pray for God's heart in these issues. We pray for our nation, and right now, especially for our state. So wouldn't it be good if we prayed right now? So Father, we come to you. And Lord, your word says that if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, then you'll hear from heaven. And God, you can heal our land. And our land is in need of healing. Lord, we ask that as we come up to this election, Lord, would you help your people, the church, to do our part as good citizens, to inform ourselves, to pray, and to vote with our biblical values in mind. Lord, that where there are places where there's deception and lies, God, that you would bring truth, and God, that you would help us to stand for the biblical principles that we know from your word. And even more, Lord, more than legislation, God, would you change hearts that through your people, God, that through us, this, this church, your people, that as we live out our faith and our lives, that other people's hearts would be changed and turned towards you, that we would see an awakening where these kinds of things would be things that we would know would be answered because your spirit is at work in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we love you. And, Lord, we ask for your help in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, are any of you people watchers? Like you like to, whether you're in the mall or you go to a park or airports are great places where you can watch people. Some of you, I've noticed this, some of you, you do a really good job of people watching in the atrium on Sunday mornings, right? You just find your spot, you get your cup of coffee and your real, little judgy look and you just watch people <laughs> kind of back and forth and then you come in here and repent and then you do it again next week and I've seen you, I know how it goes. And it's interesting what you can learn about people, right? Because people will boldly plaster themselves with identifying things about themselves, the, the teams they root for, the things they believe, the places they've been, and all those different things. Some of you like a name brand. Some of you are cool, too, too cool to wear a name brand. Like you got all those things, and you can tell a lot about other people by the way that you see them. Today, we're going to look at something where Jesus asks a question, and I think it's good for us to consider. How would you identify a follower of Jesus? What's it gonna look like? What's, what's the big thing that Jesus asks of people? It's real simple, two words, follow me. If we're gonna follow Jesus, what does that look like? We're in a series where we're working our way through Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter eight. We're talking about how when people encounter Jesus, they're never the same. Here's the story for today. Matthew chapter eight, verse 18. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. 
This is a great passage for us to look at as we're kicking off our week of missions emphasis here at Calvary. We, we believe that missions is so important to us, this calling to reach the world with the gospel, that we carve out time. This week in October, we're gonna focus on that in particular. So if, you, if you're paying attention to the kind of chronology of things, you know that last week we skipped this passage. We skipped ahead to the story where Jesus gets in the boat and he falls asleep and there's a storm on the Sea of Galilee and he speaks peace to the storm. Do you remember that from last week? Well, we skipped ahead. We, we skipped this part we're gonna look at today for two reasons. One, because it was such a good fit for Missions Week for us to look at it today. The other reason we're gonna look at here at the end of the service, but what I wanna do is just kind of walk through this passage of scripture today, kind of verse by verse, and make some observations as we look at it. So uh, let's go back to verse 18. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Jesus is at a high point in his ministry, right? He's had crowds showing up. He's just taught the Sermon on the Mount, which is one of the most important pieces of moral teaching in all of history. He not only teaches this, it says the crowds are amazed. Then he starts healing people, right? You've got the leper, centurion servant, you've got Peter's mother, you've got all these things that are happening. And there are these crowds of people. And it's interesting, with all these crowds that Jesus sees, he says to his disciples, let's get a boat and get out of here. You ever felt that way? I gotta get away from this crowd. It says he gave orders, which sounds like he's kind of bossy, but you got to understand he was the rabbi. They were the disciples. And the typical thing was for him to go, hey, um, Peter, Andrew, you, you live around here. Do you think you can get us a boat? I was like, of course we can get a boat. And so they go and they get a boat and Jesus is in the process and he's going to take off. And what happens in the process of this is that he's going to be confronted by some individuals on his way to the boat they're gonna raise some questions that you and I need to look at today. Today, what we're gonna see is what Jesus calls for in those who follow him. How do they identify themselves? We're called to be no excuse disciples. And today we're gonna look at this idea of what it means to be a no excuse disciple of Jesus. What does no excuse discipleship look like? And so Jesus is about to get in this boat. He's about to take off. And have you ever noticed that the, the wrong things seem to happen at the right time? Have you ever had that happen? Where it's like Jesus is trying to get in the boat. He's trying to get a break. He's trying to get some time away from the crowd. He's trying to get some time with his disciples. He needs a little rest. And in the process, there's gonna be two people who are gonna come and interrupt him on the way. The right things sometimes happen at the wrong time. I know this from when our kids were little. I know this from when our kids were big. Our kids could go all day and never speak one word to their father until bedtime. Do you know what I'm talking about? And you have those right conversations, sometimes at what seems like the wrong time. And that's what happens to Jesus here. Matthew chapter eight, verse 19, look at this. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So Jesus is on his way to the boat, and this guy tries to catch him. Hey, 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 Jesus, Jesus, I just, I just want you to know, man, I think you're awesome, because this guy has heard the teaching, and it says that he's a teacher of the law. So that means he knows the scripture. He is an expert at understanding it, interpreting it, teaching it to other people, and he sees Jesus. He's seen the miracles. He's heard him teach. He sees the crowds. He gets jazzed by this. He's like, I want to be a part of this. And so he's chasing after Jesus, and he says, Master, Lord, teacher, I will go with you wherever you go. Because Jesus was a pretty popular teacher. This was a pretty big deal. And so he wants to be a part of it. But Jesus notices something in this guy's life. It's not quite right, and he's gonna call it out. Here, here's the first thing I hope you'll see, is that no excuse discipleship is about lordship, not likes. No excuse discipleship is about lordship and not likes. We live in a social media culture where so much of what we deem as successful or not depends on number of followers and the likes you get. Isn't that true? Like, that's kind of the way our world moves. If you don't believe me, I'm gonna let you in on a little news. Very few have heard this. Very few of you know this, but I think some of you will find this relevant and important. I just think it's good for you to know that Travis Kelsey is dating Taylor Swift. Have you heard this? <laughs> right, have you, heard, have you seen this anywhere? 
Some of you are like, who are those people? Don't worry, they go to 815, you don't know them. And uh, yeah. And, and many of you are like, I do know who they are and I couldn't care less. And, and, and that's okay, but I wanna, I wanna show you something, right? So Travis Kelsey is a football player, Kansas City Chiefs, pretty big deal. Taylor Swift is this little musician who's getting some popularity. You, you, like, you, you, okay, yeah, yeah. So they start dating, and Taylor decides to go to the football game last Sunday. Here's some stats since she showed up at the game. Once people knew she was going to be there, female viewership of that game increased by 63%. Since that game, Travis's Instagram grew 600,000 followers and counting. And this guy's a pretty popular player. His jersey with his name on the back has since increased in sales by 400%. Now, many of you go, I don't care. But there's people who do, apparently, because the likes matter. We chase after popularity. We want to be a part of the hottest thing. We want to know that we've put the thumbs up for the right thing. And so I just kind of picture this guy running up to Jesus. He probably had his thumb up as he went, Jesus, Jesus, I like you. I want to follow you wherever you go. But Jesus saw something in this guy, and he realized that maybe this guy didn't understand the difference between likes and lordship. See, likes are temporary, but lordship is eternal. You can like something one day and unlike it the next. Isn't that true? Have you ever, have you ever accidentally liked something and then worked real hard real quick to unlike it? Anybody? Have you ever given your phone accidentally to your young adult children and they went through and started liking things on your phone to embarrass you? We've, we've dealt with that and we're going to deal with it in the will, but it has happened. It has happened in our life. You can like things and then unlike them, but lordship is eternal. And whether you realize it or not, we all give the lordship of our life to something. Our passions and lusts, our pleasures and desires, our goals and aspirations, even our hurts and disappointments or people and relationships, they can become the things that actually control and determine the course of our lives. But we only find contentment and joy and peace and meaning and ultimately salvation when we choose the lordship of something that isn't temporary but something that is eternal and so this guy with his thumbs up comes running to Jesus and he says, I, I like you. I like this teacher. I like these miracles. I like this crowd. And Jesus says, you know, maybe there's something else we need to address. You'll often hear us talk about our, our four roots or core values that we have here as a church. You'll, you'll see them on the wall or you might see it on a t-shirt, some different things. We have these four roots, these four core values. I'll read them real quick. The first one is God first. The second one is that people are the priority. We believe that if God so loved the world that he gave his only son, shouldn't we love people too? We believe that healthy things grow and we believe that we don't have to be the people of God. We get to be the people of God. We get to do this. And Jesus says this to us in Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What he says is, make sure you put God first. You can be amazed at the teacher. You can be wowed by the miracles. You can love being a part of the crowd. But at some point, you have to determine and decide for your life two words. God first. Is he really first in your life? You, you ever been in a big crowd of people where you're, where you're waiting maybe to go to a concert or a game or, or, or maybe if you've ever flown, you know what it's like to be in that security line where you're just in that huge mass of people and you're just kind of moving back and forth. You know what I'm talking about? And you're just a part of the crowd until it's your turn. And then at some point, you've got to stand in front of the ticket taker. You've got to stand in front of the TSA agent. You got to show your pass or your driver's license or your passport, your ticket, to prove that you're the one who is who you say you are and that you belong in that place. And for many of us, we like being a part of the crowd. We even like being a part of the Sunday church crowd. But at some point, Jesus is gonna ask the question, I, I wonder if some of you, it's not today that he's asking it. 
Are you just a part of the crowd with your thumb up and a smile on your face? Or are you truly willing to let Jesus be the Lord of your life? Before we go any further in this text, I think it's just fair to let you know that Jesus is gonna get pretty serious with us here. And it's not gonna hit all of us in the same way. Like for some of you, you you're already in your mind, you're, you're doing your best to be a no excuse disciple. And there will be some things that will encourage you in what we'll look at today. For others of you, I think the Lord's gonna challenge you about how you live out your faith, about sharing Jesus with those around you, about the fact that there's some sin you need to stop or there's some things you need to make right or it's gonna mean something more for you to follow Jesus. And I, and I believe this, in fact, I've prayed for this, that for some of you, what we look at and talk about today, it's gonna challenge you. It might even make you uncomfortable why wouldn't it? Because it couldn't have been comfortable for whoever heard these words from Jesus 2,000 years ago to have heard them. So maybe they should hit us in the same way today as well. God wants to challenge some of you that it's time for you to truly become a no-excuse disciple. So thumbs up, dude, comes running to Jesus, and he says, I'll follow you wherever you go, and this is what Jesus says, Matthew eight twenty. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Huh? Like, what what is it that he's trying to say? Because 2,000 years later, we might need a little help to understand this. And Jesus says, look, you know the foxes? They have their place, and the birds have their place. But if you follow me, you might not have a place to belong anymore. Is Jesus talking about homelessness here? Is he talking about poverty A lot of people have interpreted things over the years, and the reality is it does not appear that Jesus is calling for homelessness. We know that he had a home base. We know that Peter and Andrew had homes in Capernaum. That's where Jesus set up. That's where he operated his ministry from. Now, did Jesus buy a condo in Capernaum? I do not know. I don't know. But I know he's not talking about real estate, and he's not talking about your checking account. He's not talking about your 401K. He's talking about... Where do you find yourself belonging? When Jesus talks about this, you've got to understand what's, what's going to happen next. Soon Jesus is going to find out that there's places where they're not welcome. And he's going to tell his disciples that in this life, you're going to find yourself in places where people don't want you. And you'll experience persecution and hostility. And if you're going to take up your cross and follow me, that'll mean that it won't always be miracles and crowds, and smiles and thumbs up. If you're gonna follow me, some days it won't be likes. The lordship will mean something more. And here's what Jesus is trying to say, that no excuse discipleship is about sacrifice, not stability. And some of us say we follow Jesus, but it's easy for us to make stability actually the idol in our lives. And I believe this, when you follow Jesus, there is going to be a a stability, there is going to be a purpose, there is gonna be a foundation to your life you won't find any other way, isn't that true? But sometimes what happens is we like that stability so much that we're not willing to let Jesus shake things up in our lives and to trust him with our whole lives. We make stability, prosperity, our future more important than obedience. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter eight, verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Go ahead, while it's it's on the screen, take a look at that verse again. What's, What's the part that jumps out to you? Is it denying yourself? Is it taking up your cross? Is it gaining the world but losing your soul? Like what is it for you that just kind of makes you go, you know, I'm not so sure when you look at that verse. Let's let's go back to the idea of standing in, in the security line at the airport. Look, I love to travel. I love to go places. It's it's one of the, the privileges that I treasure in life. But I hate waiting in line for security and going through that. I'm thankful for it. I want to be safe. I'm thankful for those that help us. But I hate the process. Anybody else? 
Do you know why I hate the process? Because when I get to that line, I have everything where it belongs. The things are in my precious backpack the way I want them. The things are in my pocket the way I want them. If I need anything, I know just where it is. And do you know what they're about to make me do? I gotta take out some things. I gotta put in some things. I gotta empty this. I gotta fill that. I gotta do all these things. They mess the whole thing up and then I gotta take my shoes off. And I'm, I'm just gonna be honest. I get real, my family actually makes fun of me. I get real just kind of stressed out and frustrated when we get to that place because I don't like messing with my stuff. I've got everything just the way I like it. I can't go on the journey unless I go through this process. But somebody is gonna have to Touch my things, and I don't like it. Do you know what I'm talking about? And you want to see somebody look judgy? You should watch me when my family members get pulled out of the line. Just what did you pack that you shouldn't have? What do you have? Who brought a switchblade? Who brought the switchblade? <laughs> By the way, nobody ever brought a switchblade. It's just, it's just good to know. It didn't happen. We were traveling not too long ago. It was our whole crew, and everybody went through. Guess who they pulled at the end of the line? Guess who forgot they had a bottle of water in their backpack? Guess who had to wait forever because the person they pulled before me had a souvenir that had been wrapped in the gift shop as if it was going to go through a nuclear explosion. (laughs) And they waited forever. And in the process, they moved all my stuff. And I just don't like it. Because I like things just the way I like them. Anybody else can confess that with me today so I don't feel like such a weirdo? And sometimes Jesus says, hey, Chad, we might have to move some stuff around. Things might not always be the way you like it. Sometimes there's change. Sometimes if you're going to go on this journey, you have to trust me with your stuff. And the question is today, what if Jesus decided he was going to shake up some things in your life? Are you just thumbs up or is he the Lord? Do you value stability more than you value obedience? That's the question that's being asked to this first guy in Matthew chapter 8. And then Jesus gives us a second case study. First, it's thumbs up guy. Here's the next one, Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. Another disciple said to Jesus, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. So what's this guy asking permission for? Well, theologians debate on exactly what does he mean, because in the Jewish culture, it could mean several things. One, it could be just that his father is aging, probably doesn't have a whole lot longer to live, and there's things that need taken care of. So he's saying to Jesus, as Jesus is getting on the boat, He's saying, Jesus, I'll follow you, but first I gotta take care of some things at home. It it may be that his father has already passed and there was a a year-long period without going into a lot of details. After the person had been deceased for a year, they would would literally physically move their bones. It's it's an interesting process. There was also a seven-day like mourning period after someone died. So we don't know. Was he saying, I need to wait seven days? Was he saying, I need to wait a year? Was he saying, I just need to wait until my father passes? And what he was asking to do was actually a good thing, right? It ties back to the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. So what he's asking for is something that Jesus actually endorses later in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's the thing, though. When this guy said this, Jesus read his mail. He wasn't trying to be a good son. He was trying to buy some time. He wasn't making wise decisions. He was making excuses, Here's what's good for you to know about no excuse discipleship. No excuse discipleship is about priorities and not excuses. It's about saying what is the most important thing in my life. Isn't this funny? The first guy we looked at, thumbs up guy, he was making a decision too quickly. And this guy is dragging his feet, waiting for the perfect time. And can I tell you, often in spiritual things, if you are waiting for the perfect time, you will miss the right time when God says, now's the time. That's why we make a big deal out of missions, right? That's why we focus on this, because God has called us to make sure that the gospel goes 
into all the world so that those who do not know Jesus can come to faith in him. We don't have to do it. We get to do this, right? We get to be a part of this. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is what scripture refers to as the great commission. And it is the teaching that God gives to us that we are to go into all the world and to make disciples, to share the gospel. This is, if you will, kind of the job description of missions. And missions isn't just for the missionary. It's not just for the the people you'll meet in the next week. It's for all of us. Missions is praying. It starts with praying. Look, I I would encourage you that, that over the course of this next week that you find some way to connect with the missionary that you are gonna pray for. They might never know you, but there is something powerful about it. You're gonna hear stories Wednesday night. You're gonna hear stories next Sunday of the work that prayer, the difference that prayer makes in the lives of missionaries. Leah's gonna share in just a little while about how you can go out into the atrium after the service. I hope you will line up out there after service to take a step to, to find a missionary that you are gonna pray for and believe that as you pray, it's gonna make a difference. Look, if you've never specifically, by name, prayed for someone that you might not even know, there's a power to that. God answers those prayers. I've got a little spot in my office where there's five or six prayer cards of some missionaries that I have a kind of a special connection with, and I pray for them on a regular basis, in part because I know that those prayers make a difference. Missions is not just praying, missions is also giving. Missions is giving, and we, we talk about this on a regular basis. If people are going to all the world, they need the resources to go, don't they? God does that through us, through the local church. Money is one of those things that can be uncomfortable for us, but here, here's just a, a quick snapshot. We believe that the scripture teaches that everything that we have belongs to God. We're just stewards, and so we entrust to him that first 10%, the tithe, is what we give to the local church. That's, that's kind of the top. That's the first thing. And then 2 Corinthians 9 talks about how God may stir in us to do over and above, to give even more, and to give to missions. We're in the middle of this year giving to multiple projects that are being impacts for the kingdom around the world. Uh, we're hoping to raise another 75000 between now and the end of the year. And I, and I would just say this. If you have not already made it a practice to give to missions, this week, would you at the very least just ask God what he would want you to do? Just to pray and say, God, is there something that you want us to do, that you want me to do, to help to give of what you've entrusted to me to see your kingdom move forward? Missions is praying, missions is giving, and missions is going. It's aligning ourselves to what God would have for us to do. It could be as simple as just Showing up to one of the events this week. That's, that's a great first step that you come out Tuesday for pizza prizes and purpose, that you come out Wednesday for a really special time of prayer together. But I'll, I'll take it another step further. I, I know what God is stirring in some of your hearts is to take a short-term trip to go on one of the trips we'll do next year. And every time God's kind of called you in that way, you've just kind of silenced it because you weren't so sure. And 2024 is the year you should go. For others of you, God's calling you to do something even more. And you're not exactly sure what to do with it. You just know that he's stirring in your life in some way. And it's time to not put on a show anymore. It's time to not kind of hide it, not to kind of make people think a certain thing. But are you willing to stop making excuses and be the person that God's calling you to be? And sometimes it's easier to just Make people think one thing about you in the process. Let, let me show you this. There was, a, there was a pastor on the continent of Africa recently who decided he wanted to do something unique. Here's a, here's a picture of him. He decided to stage this. He wanted to recreate Daniel in the lion's den to show how much he trusted in God. And so he had them lock him in a cage with three lions, lock him in there, and he just wanted to prove how faithful God was, and so he was touching them and all these things. It was only later discovered that he wasn't a pastor, he was a zookeeper, and those were the lions he had trained and had worked with them on all these different occasions. He wasn't some holy man. He just wanted people to think he was more holy than he really was. 
And this is a part of that. Like, what, how are we living our lives? What is it that we're trying to portray? What if God were to call you? What if God were to reach out to you? What if there was something that God wanted you to do through your life? If he were to call, how would you respond? Like, what would you, what would you do in that moment? <laughs> this is my worst nightmare. Is that you or is it me? I am always, I am always, I'm always the one that makes sure my phone's off. Sorry. But God has good timing, doesn't he? <laughs> what if God were to call? It's not him. It's not him. I got his number. He's got my number, actually. And, uh, but what if God were to call you? Oh, for crying out loud. All right, Leah, that's enough. <laughs> Two things I want you to see there. One, for some of you, it's real easy. When your phone goes off in church, there's just a little button on the side. <laughs> Two, some of us, God's been calling us. You know that little button on the side where you just silence things? We have a spiritual one. And where God calls, we look and we go, oh, God, that's a bad time. Oh, God, not right now. God, I don't have time to pray. God, I know, I know you want me to give, but man, the bills we've got coming up. Well, God, I, I know you want me to share my faith, but what will they think? Or God, I know you want me to open up my home, but I don't know what that's gonna mean. Or God, I know you're stirring in me to do something new, but God, you're messing with my stuff. And God calls and we hit that side button on our lives, that spiritual silence button so quickly. The question if God was gonna call you, if he is calling you, what are you going to do? Are you going to make that call a priority? Or are you going to make excuses? And so this guy comes and he says to Jesus, Lord, I'll follow you. Just first I've got to take care of a couple of things. And here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. It's kind of cold, isn't it? seems heartless when you look at that passage. Scholars debate about exactly what Jesus meant. The, the one thing that I read that really struck with me, I, I think Jesus was kind of saying to the guy, hey, why don't you follow me and let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead because I have something more for you to do. I also think Jesus knew more about this guy than he realized. And he knew that it wasn't as urgent as this guy said. He also knew there were other people who could take care of it. He also knew that this guy was trying to wait for the perfect time when Jesus said, hey, now's the right time. What this guy was doing was not making sure he did the right thing. This guy was making excuses. And so Jesus said, you need to stop making excuses. And you need to follow me. Because no excuse discipleship is about new life and not dead faith. And this guy wanted to just stay in his dead faith. And Jesus said, no, I've got something new. In fact, if, if you look at this same story in the Gospel of Luke, look at what Jesus said, Luke 9, 60. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. He, he says, I've got something more for you to do. So are you gonna make a difference or are you gonna make excuses? Are you gonna be obedient or are you gonna look for other ways? Are you gonna stay just kind of dead in the place where you are? Or are you willing to trust me with new faith? It's a powerful thing when you think about it. And if you go back and you read, there's a, there's a part of this story that's interesting. I'll be honest, it's frustrating to me because you got thumbs up guy. Do you remember him? And Jesus says, foxes have nests and birds have, you know what he says, the foxes and birds are covered. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And then what did the guy do next? We don't know. Matthew doesn't tell us. Does he say, Jesus, it doesn't matter, I'm all in, and he jumped in the boat? Or did he say, mm, I didn't think about that. I'll, I'll catch you next time you come around. And then there's Barry, my father guy. And he says, Jesus, I'll, I'll follow you later. I just gotta take care of some things at home. And then Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. You follow me. And then what did he do? We don't know. We don't know if he said, ah, you're right, Jesus. I'm just making excuses. Let's go. Or did he say, yeah, uh, good, good. I'll catch you next time. 
And I think maybe the reason that the Bible doesn't tell us what they did is because you have to make the decision for yourself. What are you going to do? Are you going to be a disciple or an excuse maker? It's an interesting story when you look at it and when you see it. And there's a reason why we postponed this one until after we read the one about the storm. Isn't it powerful what these people had seen? They had heard Jesus teach, and it was a teaching that they said amazed everyone. And then they saw him touch a leper, a leper, and the leper was cleansed. And then they heard with just a word from him, and the centurion's servant was healed. And then they've also had the opportunity to see, and we've had the opportunity to see, they didn't know, but we had the opportunity to see, that Jesus can speak to nature and the winds stop, and the waves are calm. So he has authority over disease. He has authority over nature. The question is not will sickness obey him. The question is not will the storm obey him. The question is will you obey him? Because he has authority over everything. But will you give him authority over your life? Or is it just today for another excuse? One last thing I want you to see. Look at this, Matthew chapter eight, verse 23. Because here's the thing. Some of you, as soon as I start talking about making excuses, you go, well, this might cost me something. Or this might not be safe. Or I don't know what's ahead. Or I don't know what would be next. Matthew chapter eight, verse 23. Remember at the beginning of this story, they were preparing to get in the boat. Verse 23, then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. And do you remember what happened after they got out on the boat? They went through a a storm. If you follow Jesus, it won't always be easy, but he will always be with you. And what we'll see in a couple of weeks is that when they got on the other side of the storm, God did amazing things and change people for eternity. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to stand and we're gonna sing a song that we're gonna make our prayer. But whether you're watching this on a screen somewhere or whether you're sitting in the building today, I've asked you to just kind of find a moment with your heads bowed and your eyes closed where where the Holy Spirit could speak clearly to you. Has your faith been more about likes than lordship? And are you holding on so closely to your stuff, to your stability, that you're not so sure what you'd do if Jesus called you today? In fact, some of you, there have been places, there have been things that have been going on in your life that Jesus calls and you silence over and over again. And he's calling you to surrender your life to him or he's calling you to take a step of faith or he's calling you to share about what Jesus has done for you or he's calling you in some way to do something new for him. Some of you, I truly believe God is calling you to to step into a, a call on your life and it's time to stop silencing the call and say no more excuses, Jesus, I'll follow you. Through every storm, through every blessing, I'm gonna choose to follow you. Then this song will become our prayer today and it just very simply says, you can have it all, Lord, every part of my world. And if you mean it, will you sing it with great conviction and commitment today? Jesus, all of my life is yours. Will you stand with me, please? Father, thanks for your word. And Lord, we surrender our lives to you today. No more excuses. We're disciples who follow you. And so you can have it all, Lord. It's all yours. In Jesus' name, amen.
into your word today, words that you spoke. But for others of us, Lord, I know this was very timely because you're calling to us in, in places of our stability or in places of our excuses and calling us to make you our Lord and to follow you. Lord, so for the one who's making decisions today, for the one who's dreaming about the future, God, for the, the one who just feels a, a something stirring in their chest right now because they know you're, you're doing something in their lives, that there's things you're shaping. You're going to shape them this week. Lord, there's some that you're going to call to do things that they never thought they would do because of how your spirit is working in their heart right now. Lord, you can have it all. It's all yours, Lord. And we entrust ourselves to you. And Father, thank you that your word makes it clear that as we go, as we follow you, we do it with your special favor and with your wonderful peace. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, as Leah comes, can we thank the Lord for his word today?